Diabetes insipidus is not the disorder of glucose or sugar regulation. That is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes insipidus is a disorder of body water regulation. Diabetes insipidus, also referred to as DI, is the opposite of SIADH, or Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone, and it is characterized by the excretion of large amounts of urine, up to 5 to 20 liters a day. Now remember, normal urinary output is about 1.5 liters a day. So, this free water loss that we see in diabetes insipidus can be due to three causes. One is decreased production of antidiuretic hormone by the hypothalamus. Two might be caused by decreased secretion of ADH by the posterior pituitary gland. And three, the cause might be due to decreased renal response to ADH. So the problem can be happening at the level of the hypothalamus, the problem can be the posterior pituitary gland, or the problem can be the renal response or the kidneys. So manifestations of DI include polydipsia, which is excessive thirst, and polyuria, which is characterized by excessive urination. Hypernatremia, or increased sodium levels, and hyperosmolar, meaning that there's an increased osmolality of the blood, usually greater than 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. So given that these two diseases are unrelated, why do they share names? And what is the difference between diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus? Well, the answer is that diabetes insipidus is a disease of antidiuretic hormone and fluid regulation. Diabetes mellitus is a disease of glucose regulation. But both diseases do cause polydipsia and polyuria. The two major types of diabetes insipidus are neurogenic, meaning from the brain, and nephrogenic, meaning from the kidneys. In neurogenic DI, also referred to as central DI, this can be caused by any organic lesion that interferes with ADH synthesis, ADH transport, or ADH release. And oftentimes, the cause is a stroke, a tumor, or a traumatic brain injury. And yes, these can cause either SIADH or DI. So the treatment for neurogenic DI is to replace the free water with hypotonic solution, and we want this to equal the urinary losses. Half normal saline is a solution that is often ordered to replace the fluid loss. We may also see hormonal replacement with a drug called desmopressin acetate, or DDAVP, and this is an analog of the antidiuretic hormone. This can be given orally, intravenously, or by a nasal spray. Chlorpropramide, or diabenese, is another drug that can help ADH. What it does is it helps the circulating ADH work better and it stimulates the endogenous release of ADH. This means the release of ADH within the body. So in nephrogenic DI, which is the kidneys being affected, this is the condition where there's adequate ADH levels, but the kidneys are failing to respond appropriately. And lithium is a common cause of an NDI, or nephrogenic DI, because it blocks the effect of ADH on the kidneys at the level of the renal tubules. So in nephrogenic DI, if the oral intake cannot keep up with the urinary losses, then we will see a severe fluid volume deficit in our patient. And we will also see weight loss, constipation, poor skin turgor, hypotension, tachycardia, and shock. 
So treatment for nephrogenic DI would include a low sodium diet, um, usually no more than three grams per day, and this may help decrease the urine output. Thiazide diuretics are another treatment for nephrogenic DI because these medications, hydrochlorothiazide and diuril, actually slow the kidney filtration rate and they're allowing for more absorption of free water. Management includes IV replacement to equal fluid loss, oral fluid replacement, strict intake and output, and daily weights. And in this case, we're measuring the patient for daily weight loss. Labs we will look at include urine-specific gravity. Normal is 1.005 to 1.030. And the urine-specific gravity in DI is going to be less than 1.005. However, the serum osmolality, which is normally 285 to 295, is going to be increased greater than 295. Because remember, the urine is going to be very dilute. However, the blood is going to be very hyperosmolar. Next, we're going to talk about the anterior pituitary gland.